you know, Abraham's our father in the faith. And, you know, a lot of times you recognize someone based on if, if you know their dad or their grandfather because you're like, man, that, that kid looks like their grandfather. It looks like they're dead. I mean, is that not true? I mean, you might not know their name. You might not know their family. But the look, there's a look that you can just tell this person looks like, you know, I mean, like the Ridgeways. They, you can tell, you know, they're all related. And um, Abraham is our father. And one of the traits I believe, I may not look like Abraham, but one of the traits that I have is I believe God like Abraham does. And I believe that's something that, that we all should be able to, to say and, and, and to, to obtain. Because, you know, you might, you might say, man, you just you act like this person. You know, like children have traits of their dad. You know, I remember um, when I used to play soccer, um, my mom said every time I'm out there, because I used to be a forward and whenever we're, we're resting or we're, we're waiting, I would always put my hands on my hip and, and on my hips. And the way I would stand, my mom said, your dad would do the same thing. And it just looked like your dad standing out there. And, but, you know, our father, Abraham, he did something extraordinary that no one else had to do. I mean, it's not recorded that anyone else did what he did. And God didn't ever ask anybody to do what God asked Abraham to do. And that's our father, you know, and. One of the, the things that excite me about it is, for one, he wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost. He wasn't washing the blood. He wasn't sealed, you know, with the Holy Spirit. He wasn't seated in heavenly places yet. Jesus had not come. He had not been risen. He had not died yet. And Abraham could do that without even having a Bible. He didn't have the Gospels. He didn't have the Epistles. But yet, he stood so strong in faith that it pleased God. You know, we all know um, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And the only way faith comes is by the word, by hearing the word and reading the word over and over and over and over and over, right? So look at uh, Romans chapter 4. Now I know in this church, when you, when you come into Romans, you better know something about Romans because I don't think um, there's ever been another pastor that has preached about Romans like Max has. So I tread on this with caution. <laughs> you know, in, in, in Romans chapter 4, if you look in verse 17, it says, as, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. And a lot of times, if we just read the, the scripture, just to read the scripture and say, well, I read it and praise God, we've already missed it. Because to have an attitude of, oh, I, I heard that, or I've read that, there's pride involved. And that means we're, we're shut off to whatever God wants to say now. You know, if, if we acknowledge and we know that this is a living word, that means we're always getting something, always getting something. You might have heard it a million times. Well, the million and one, that's when revelation comes. You know, I have made you. You know, I love when, when the Bible says that God has made us. He's made known to us the mystery. He, he seated us. You know, he, he sat us in a place we could never ask for. But he says, no, this is what comes with it. I'm going to seat you. I'm going to make you to sit in heavenly places in Christ. Right? But he says, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who he believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now that's something that God expects us to do. To have the faith and have the verbiage of, I'm, a, I'm, I'm able to call something that is dead back to life or to be alive. We can do that. Whatever it is, right? Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. See, Abraham became something that God had already made him. And the reason why he became it is because he did what God asked him to do. Right? According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And, and one of the things that I love is God said, this is how many descendants you're going to have before you have one. You know? Remember when God brought him out of the tent? He says, look up in the sky and count the stars. And, and what's amazing is Abraham's looking up in the sky. Obviously, there was no clouds that night because he could see all the stars. And, you know, he wasn't just looking at stars. I mean, he was, but he just wasn't because God knows the stars by name. Right? So he's looking up into the sky and saying, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And, and however far and wide he could see, he's not just looking at stars, but he's looking at things that God named. And God says, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham's like, okay, okay. He wasn't yet, but that's what he was going to be, right? And not in verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. 
You know, on this one of this scripture, on this scripture, one of the things I like is he wasn't weak in faith. And it's because he didn't consider not. He didn't consider his own body dead and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So if we take this scripture and we apply it to our lives, there's things that we can look at and we can consider it dead. We can consider it too far gone. I've done it. I'm sure we all have, you know, and maybe not realizing we did, but we have, you know, we could say, well, there's just no hope. It's too far gone. You know, one of the things that the Lord said to me earlier this year was I, I got to witness something where this individual said that they were going to move and, and go to another place. And, and this other individual just, it really tore them up. You know, I mean, up and down because it was, there was just a lot was said. And, and the person that hearing it was thinking a lot about what's going to happen based on what was said. And it messed with their sleep. It messed with a lot of things. It kind of hindered the relationship a little bit because things were said. You know, I mean, there's a lot that happened. And as I'm watching this, I remember the Lord said, if it's not, this is what he said to me, and, and take this, and it might help you. He said, if it's not thus saith the Lord, it's all subject to change. Meaning, no matter what anybody says, if they don't come up and to you and say, well, this is what God said to me to tell you, just know that it's all subject to change. And it's all subject to change based on God. Because he's the only one that knows the end from the beginning. He's the only one that knows that false information or fake news, right, <laughs> is, is being shared right now. And, and watch for this. You know, I remember um, my, my wife was sharing with me that Kenneth Copeland said this uh, by the word of the Lord. Do not pay attention to the media before Trump got elected. And if you paid attention to the media, you would have thought it's going the other way. And if you, were, if you were thinking it was going the other way, people's minds and their hearts already had preconceived ideas and scenarios already played out of what's going to happen if so-and-so gets elected. And you know what? It was so flipped around. I mean, that's a perfect example of if it's not thus saith the Lord, it's all subject to change. You know, and here he didn't consider his own body. There's things that you might be looking at right now that you might be considering, and, and it's good to, to check up and saying, am I considering my own body? Am I considering my own uh, accounts? Am I considering my family? Am I considering my situation, or am I considering what the Word says? Because if we consider what the Word says, then we're going to look at what the Word says, and we're going to look at a situation, and now you have a choice of the Word's not going to change, but the Word will change this. But if I, if I choose to look at this and not the Word then I'm going to remain here. But if I look at the word and remain with the word, this will change. Does that make sense? The only reason why Abraham could become what he became is because he didn't consider his own body and the deadness of Sarah's own. I mean, the deadness. Meaning, she's not having a baby. Except by the word of the Lord. Right? He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. I love that because the, the opportunity to waver was there. He could see it with his eyes. I mean, everything that he had known, it was just facing him. And, and there's only one thing that he held on to, the promise of God. The promise of God. Verse 21, and being fully convinced that what God had promised, God was also able to perform. If we were to put ourselves in this story right now, could you say, could I say, I'm fully convinced as I look at this situation that God is able to change us around, that he's fully, that I'm fully convinced that God is able to do what he said. Meaning, if the doctor says you have this, can, can we be fully convinced that we can say, I believe the report of the Lord and by his stripes I have been healed. That he did take my sickness and he did take my disease. He did take the stripes on his back so I don't have to suffer. Can we be fully convinced that the Bible is true and every man a liar? You know, and only you can answer that, you know, because you're the only one in those shoes that, are, that is facing that and you have all the emotions and all the thoughts that go with it. But when we're fully convinced that the Bible is true, when we're fully convinced that God is real, and that's where I believe the hinge is a lot of times because if God is not real, if he's just something, somebody way out there, then he's, he's real that far away. There's people in Africa that they're real, but they don't affect you because you don't see them. You don't have a relationship with them. You know that they're starving. You know that they're dying, but it doesn't affect you. It's not a thought because they're so far. But when someone becomes so close to you, 
There's emotions that, 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 that marry together. And a stranger can become a best friend. And then when something happens to that stranger, it affects you. You do something for them because they're real. They're a real person. But God is so much more real than people. Does that make sense? I mean, he's, he's so real that what we consider real came out of him. So if we look at what is the truth, what is, what is really real, that's what we are to obtain. That's what we're to hold, to, to look upon. You know, one of the things I was sharing with Kim and Kim the other night was that I saw was God asked Abraham to do something he'll never ask anybody else to ever do. God asked Abraham to offer up Isaac so that Jesus could come and do what he did. Does it make sense? It, it, God wasn't saying, you know what, I just want to see how crazy somebody would be in faith, so let's just... Let's just ask this man to offer up Isaac. There, there was a purpose. There was a purpose for him offering, asking, uh, uh, asking Abraham to offer up Isaac. And one of the things I, I thoroughly enjoy is when you read the story when God told him, offer up Isaac on this mountain. He didn't take his time. He didn't say, that mountain? Well, why not this mountain? Are you sure that mountain, God, this doesn't make sense. Why do I got to walk that far? I mean, there's this mountain right here. Why, why do I have to go to the, he did, there was, there was nothing like that going back and forth. In fact, he got everything he needed. He started heading that way. And then he, he was, had two people, or he had men with him. And he says, stay here. Does anybody know his response when, after what he said? He, when he says, wait here. He said, the young lad and I will return. Knowing what he had to do, he still says, we're returning. He didn't say, now wait here because I'm going to offer up Isaac. So, you know, just chill here for a couple of days. Could you imagine the conversation that would have happened and the, and the delay that it would have caused? Because now you're going to have these guys say, wait, wait, wait. Why? Why are you going to do that? That's crazy. You know, you, you never had a son and now you have a son. And you see how doubt can come in? Same thing with, with Martha and Mary when Jesus came to raise Lazarus up. All the excuses, all the reasons. Lord, he, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You know, well, this, he's been dead for four days. There's going to be a stench now. I mean, all of these things, they start saying, rather than saying, thank you for showing up, because I know what, man, I heard all the stories that, you know, Jesus shouldn't have had told them to roll the stone away. Mar Martha and Mary should have said, hey, Jesus showed up, move that stone. That's where their faith should have been because of all the things they'd heard of what Jesus has done. And they knew him. They, they were so close to him. I mean, it, it talks about the relationship. They should have known, man, when Jesus shows up, so much stuff happens. Hey, move the stone. But they were so focused. They were considering something else to the point that even when Jesus says, look, I am the resurrection, you know did I not say to you, if you'd believe, you would see. I mean, he had, to, he had to help her to get to that place. But, you know, Abraham, when he saw the mountain, he's like, that's the mountain. I got to go, and that's where I'm going to go, and I'm just going to take Isaac. And, and, I mean, they're walking up there, and all of a sudden, Isaac says, whoa, hey, we've got this, this, and this, but where's the, where's the sacrifice, man? He's putting this stuff together, and he's understanding. We're here to sacrifice, and there is no sacrifice. And what was, God, what was Abraham's response? The Lord will provide himself one. Right? The Lord will provide himself one, so don't worry about it. Next thing you know, Isaac is up on the... <laughs> and he's probably thinking, Lord, you're supposed to provide yourself one. My daddy said you would. And, and Abraham was so focused and fixed. You know, he could, have, he could have circled a different mountain a few days. And said, Lord, maybe, maybe it's this mountain. You know, he could have played stupid. I mean, have you ever done that? I've done that before. Play stupid with God. Lord, are you sure? I mean, don't you know? Didn't, have, didn't you think about this? Did you really think this through, Lord? I mean, am I the only one that's done that? <laughs> you know, Abraham was fully persuaded. He was fully convinced knowing God is able. He's able to do it. If he asked me to do it, he's going to do it. And he went there. And the angel of the Lord had to call to him twice. And then he looked up, and guess what's right there in the bushes, stuck in the bushes? 
I mean, this thing wasn't stuck in a fence. I can understand if there's a fence and this ram got stuck in a fence. But what ram just walks up into a bush and gets stuck in a bush? A ram that God provides, right? So it's, it, it just goes to show whenever God asks us to do something, the answer, we would want the answer right away. We get the answer right away. We just don't see it visibly right away. The sacrifice was already provided, and it was provided when God said, offer up Isaac. God already, he, he didn't say, oh man, I asked him to do this. Now I got to provide. Now I got to perform. God is never on the end of, I got to play catch up. He's always on the end of, do this because I've already, already got it made out. Does that make sense? You know, when you think about it, what makes us comfortable is, Lord, you've asked us, to, you, you asked us to give, or you asked us to step out, or you asked us to lay hands on this person. I sure would like to feel an anointing, or, or see the money first, or, or hear the good news first. But that's not faith. Faith is, Lord, I, I heard what you said, and I'm going to take the step. I'm going to run, and I'm going to do it, and I expect. And sometimes it comes when you feel like, I think I'm all by myself. I've had those feelings. You know, one time I went to um, Peru and I was reading Smith Wigglesworth books. And I mean, I was so stirred up in faith, man. I just felt like, man, let me out of this plane. I could just walk on the air. You know, I mean, I was just charged reading these books and I'm excited. And we go to this hospital and here's this man. He's about as dark skinned as I am, but he's yellow. And I lay my hands on him, and, and I'm expecting this guy to just jump out this bed. I really am. And I'm so stirred up. And I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And I'm looking, and nothing happens. So now I'm processing in my lightning fast mind, like, what do I do? I mean, I'm expecting him to get out the bed. And I get rebuked by the Lord. And he, says, if, <laughs> he says, either say it like you mean it or don't say it at all. Well, I thought I meant it. I really did. But that's not a time to argue with the Lord and saying, Lord, no, you're wrong. I meant it. <laughs> so I realized what that meant. Say it again and say it like I mean it. So I told the family, I says, look, I'm not going to put a curse on them. I'm just going to, they're like, do whatever, basically. So I put my hands on this guy and now I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to say this and this guy is definitely going to come up alive out of this thing. And I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed nothing happened and I realized well now I'm listening do I get rebuked again do I get corrected and I, I didn't hear anything so I just thought well this is a fig tree situation and just went on and there was four people in the room in, in beds and by the time we were done because he was a second person after the fourth person were walking out and the Lord said look and I turn around and the guy is sitting up in the bed now I would rather have had him sit up after I said it to be honest because it would have really helped me a whole lot more in my mind it would have helped me more in my mind but you know what it still helped me more than I realized because I realized this was a fig tree situation I still got what I wanted but it's not really what I want it's how is God going to get glory in this and maybe he needed me to get out of the way after I said it so he could do what he's going to do so that way I don't ruin anything you know, because a lot of times, we, hey, I'm going to take up this, I'm going to preach right here. And God's like, I don't want you to preach. Let me work. You know, so sometimes we, we consider things like it's not happening or we just got to consider what did, the, what did God say to do? What did he say to do? That's all we need to know. You know, when Peter got out the boat, he didn't say, Lord, command me to come out the boat. And then when he jumped out the boat, he didn't say, now what? Do I walk to you? You know, are you sure it's going to hold me? I know I'm out the boat. You know, he, he went off of what Jesus said, come. What does that mean, come? If you tell your children, come here, and they stand back there, what, are, what is your thoughts? <laughs> come here, right? Right over here. I told you to come here. And if they said, well, do you want me to come over there? I mean, you're, you're fixing to start whooping somebody because you're thinking, man, I've already called you four times, and, and you're not here yet, right? No? Okay. I mean, the Lord said, come. It would be foolish for Peter to say, do you want me to walk to you? Think about this, okay? Let's just say, uh, 
you get a quarterback, he gets the ball. And the plan is, he tells the running back, when the ball is hiked to me, I'm going to give it to you, and you're going you're gonna to do a sweep to the right, and you're going to run for the end zone, because that's, that's, that's the plan, right? Okay, break. They get in line. The ball is hiked. Right? The quarterback gets it. He gives it to the running back, and the running back stops and says, are you sure you want me to run? I got the ball. Do you really want me to run? Should I take a knee right here? I mean, there's going to be a problem after this, after this guy gets smothered because it's like, dude, we made the hole. You, 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 could, you could have made it. You're the running back. Why didn't you run? Well, you know, I just I need to make sure. I just wasn't sure if you wanted me to run, you know. Maybe, just maybe, you really didn't want me to run. Would that make sense? But yet, we, a lot of times people do that with God. God says, go and lay your hands. And they say, well, Lord, you sure you want me to lay hands on this person? I don't know if it's your will, Lord. You sure you want me to do this, Lord? And you know, what we always have to remember is, God already gave the command. He already said to do something. He already said, here's the book. Here's how to get faith. Here's, here's the instructions. I know, like most men, they'll grab the instructions and say, yeah, I'm going to build it myself. <laughs> I've done that. And then wonder, why does this thing not look like what it's supposed to look like? Why do I have all these leftover parts? <laughs> well, you get leftover parts, for one, Sometimes it'll tell you, you're going to have this many screws left over. But when you've got leftover boards, now that's a problem. You know? But when you look at Romans again, being fully convinced, in verse 21, that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. If you look in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Is that true? It is true. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. Well, Abraham didn't have the power that worked in him like we have the power that works in us. Abraham wasn't seated like we're seated. Abraham wasn't purchased like we're purchased. We live in a better covenant. And if Abraham can believe God the way he believed God, how much more should we be able to believe God like Abraham believed God. Abraham didn't have a book to read. He didn't have, he didn't have all the apostles to, to hear. He didn't have the gospel. He didn't have anything that we have. But yet he could do one of the greatest things that God have, has ever asked a man before Jesus. I mean, think about it. God is not asking you to offer up your son or your daughter. He's just asking you to step out the boat. Abraham already paved the way. God's not asking us to do a new thing. He's asking us just to do the same thing, go the same direction. And then some people might think, well, that's too difficult. Okay, well, Jesus is our example, right? An example means you follow like. We have the mind of Christ. So he is our example. We're in him and he's in us. It should be so simple to do whatever it is he's wanting us to do, to believe whatever he's wanting us to believe. You know, I always tell people this, find out what God said and go with that. You don't need to know everything. Nowhere in the Bible has, have I found that we have to understand everything about God. We just need to know what he said. And once we hear what he said and we step out on that, then, then he'll give us the next thing. Because what's most important is, Lord, what did you say? Because he's obligated to bless, to protect, and to have, you know, put favor on us and all of that on what he said. He's not obligated to do what we, whatever we want in disobedience. Right? If you ask your child to take out the trash and then they painted the house and mowed the lawn and washed your car and all that, and you're like, that's great. Thank you. But the trash is reeking in the garage. And you're like, I'm glad you did all of that, but all I wanted... All I wanted was you to take the trash out. And if that person came, yeah, but look, I worked so hard. I did so much. I mean, you know, you see this in, in Matthew where they say, Lord, Lord, have we not done all this in your name? And his response was, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I know you not. 
We casted out devils in your name. We healed the sick. We did all of this in your name. And he might have said, all I wanted you to do was teach Sunday school. All I wanted you to do was attend faithfully. All I wanted you to do was go down and visit the people. And, you know, it's very simple stuff. I remember I wanted to go to Africa so bad. I believe I'll get to go there someday. But when I was at Rayma, my heart was, oh, I want to go to Africa. I want to do a mission trip in Africa. And, and these people started inviting me. And, and the Lord says, no, go here, and go here, and go here. And I got frustrated one day. I said, Lord, I want to go to a place that a lot of people don't want to go. Why aren't you sending me? He says, I didn't ask you to go there. I've asked other people to go. But I'm wanting you to go here. And you know, have I, if I went down there out of disobedience, I'm sure stuff could have probably happened. But then I would have been out of his will. Doing good things out of his will. But it's better to be where he said to be, doing what he said to do, because God's going to get the most glory that way. You know, I believe that our shadows ought to heal people. And the only way our shadow can heal people is if it falls on the people, as if we walk in the right place, you know. So I do believe in being led. I do believe in seeking God. I do believe in hearing what God wants us to do. Because you might, it might sound so ridiculous. You might mean your shadow can heal people. Well, Peter's shadow healed people, right? That's in the book of Acts. We're still in the book of Acts. You know, God might say, walk on this side of the street. Well, Lord, you know, that's just the wrong side to walk on. You're not supposed to walk on that side. You know, I don't want to get arrested. I don't want to... The shop that I need to goes on this side of the street. So why should I walk on that side of the street? Could you imagine if we would obey and we walk, and then you walk by someone that's in a wheelchair, one of those wheelchairs that, those motorized ones, and they're just in bad condition. The, the type of people that a lot of people will look at and say, whoa, that's a tough case for God, which is really not true. But you walk by and your shadow falls on them, and then you turn around because somebody's shouting, hallelujah, praise God, and and you turn around and they're up out of the wheelchair and leaping and praising God. And you're thinking, what happened? And then they say, man, you walked right by me. And the power of God just, I know it's the power of God. And it just fell on me. And there's this warmth from the top of my head. And it went all the way down to my feet. And, and could you imagine that? Because at that moment, you would be like, Lord, I about missed you. Based on what side the shop was on. But when we fully are persuaded of what, that God knows what he's doing. We don't consider our own ways. We don't consider our own thoughts. We don't consider our own bodies. We don't consider our own of anything. But we consider Him. And His word to be true. And His word to be final authority. When we do that, there's a saying that I like to tell my wife. We're always at the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing. We are. I firmly believe that. And does something happen all the time? We may not see it. But I know something was planted. And if something's planted, that means it can grow. God can't get a harvest if there's nothing planted. And if he says, hey, you're going to plant, and I'm going to water it, my job is to plant. You know, when I laid hands on that guy, I wanted to see the harvest right away. But I had to plant the seed in him. So his ears could hear it, so God could work. And God was working. And when I turned around, a man was sitting up, and he wasn't yellow. And we had to leave at that time. And I really wanted to go and talk to the guy. But it helped me realize, as long as I do what God says to do, God will be glorified and the results will always be what I wanted. I mean, have you ever been in the position where you say hindsight is twenty twenty? With God, we, we come across that a lot if, if we teeter on things. But if we just say, Lord, I'm just going to obey you, I don't care what it looks like. You know, later on, 2020 will be like, I'm glad that I obeyed God because now I see how it happened. You know, it didn't make sense for Jesus to be crucified, buried, and resurrected. It didn't make sense to mankind. It made no sense to the enemy because he was rejoicing about it. But he had no idea. Come Sunday morning, he was in trouble forever. If you think about it. You know, the disciples. P Peter, I'll share this and I'm just about done. Peter, I'll say it like this. You know when he denied Christ, he said, I don't know the man. 
I'm going to say it like this. Part, part of it was true in a sense. I mean, he was lying because he knew Jesus. But he didn't know Jesus in that condition. He never seen Jesus in a natural state of defeat. Jesus wasn't defeated. Peter always saw Jesus being drawn to being, the people being drawn to him. He always saw Jesus healing people, casting out devils, feeding multitudes. He saw Jesus calming the storm, right? Walking on the water. Peter knew Jesus first by the miracle of the fish in the net. That was his introduction. Depart from me, for I'm a, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus, I'm going to make you a fisher's of men. Come follow me. So from that day, Peter knew Jesus by the miracles, by the healings, by the love, the compassion. Peter never saw compassion until he saw Jesus be moved with compassion. And then the night that they came into the garden, the book of John says when they came and they said, Jesus said, who are you looking for? It says, Jesus. He says, when he says, I am he, they all fell down. And this is how deceiving the enemy is. Imagine this, you go to get Jesus and, when, and you're standing there and when he says, I am he, you get knocked down by the power of God and you still get back up and say, I'm still going to capture you. Talk about blind, right? And then there's a scuffle and then a man, you know, Malchus, whatever his name, his ear comes off because Peter is just slashing away and then Jesus puts it back on. And you're part of the band of raiders that came to, to, you know, the guards to come and get Jesus. Peter never seen Jesus in chains before. He always saw him walk through the crowd. Just walk right through the midst of him. So now all of a sudden, could you imagine the mentality of Peter looking at Jesus and saying, what is going on? This doesn't make sense. Jesus, say something, man. They're, they're lying about you. They're spitting. Say something. You know, he, he, he's standing there, and he, he's, I believe that he just, his mind, he got carnal, and just, it went a spiral downhill. Who is this man? I don't know. I've never seen him like this. Why isn't he saying anything? Normally, he's always witty with what the Lord says to say, and, and now he's not saying anything. And then, Peter sees Jesus have to carry his cross and after the scourging and all of that, he's like, could you imagine what Peter was going through? Psychologically, what was he going through to see Jesus, whom he'd known for about three years or, or however long? This is not what I thought. I thought we were going to be like best friends forever. And now you're, you're there and I'm here. And, I, and, and Peter felt lost. Could you imagine that? When you look at it, Peter was the one that says, Lord, if that's you on the, on, in the storm, bid me to come out. And he, he went to Jesus. In the end of John, when he's fishing, he went back to what he knew. After him. I don't know psychologically what he was going through knowing. I'm still trying to figure. I mean, when, when one of our loved ones dies suddenly... Some people are really shocked and they're still trying to gather their thoughts. Now imagine Jesus, what Peter saw, what he experienced, what he heard, the revelations, the presence of God that he felt. And then now it's different. He's trying to gather that. So he goes back to what he knows. And then when he sees Jesus on the shore, and you know the story in the John, Jesus throw your net on the other side of the boat. They catch all the fish. It says he recognized that was Jesus and he jumped out of the boat to get back to where Jesus was. And then Jesus restored him. And then we know the story that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 get saved. But think about what Peter went through. He didn't consider what Jesus has already done. He was considering what he was going through. And it affected him to deny Christ. Now there are people who say, well, I would never deny Christ. Peter denied Jesus. And he walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He handled Jesus. I'm not saying that we would, but I'm just saying is if he's not real, if God is not real, if he's just so far away, a voice, if he's just, yeah, he's God, he's my Savior, he's my Lord. If he's just that and he's not real, then we're not going to consider him, but we're going to consider what we're going through. But when he's so real and he's so big and he's so grand in our lives, 
then we can say, I'm not going to consider what the doctor says. I'm not going to consider what anybody says. You get the worst news and you go and you say, Lord, what do you say about this? You know, if someone comes and, and says, um, like I was, when I was with, with Terrell on the, in Honduras a couple trips ago, we were talking and, and somebody said, what would you do if you found out that a loved one died? Would you just leave? And I says, no. I'm not, I'm not going to leave the mission field just because I get bad news. So they said, well, what if you get news that, that your wife got in a car accident and died? I said, that doesn't mean I leave the mission field that God called me to come to. And this lady kind of got just a little stir crazy, you know, and what, what do you mean? I said, what I would do is I would say, Lord, what do you say? Because the Lord might just say, call life back to her body and remain, in, remain here and finish up the, the assignment. I said, what if I get in a panic and I rush to the hospital? Oh, I got to get to the airport and I get in a wreck in the airport. Now I got a dead wife in the, in the States and now I'm in the hospital here in Honduras. I said, what good is that going to do? I said, I would first say, Lord, what do you say? Because what if the Lord wanted to translate me? What if he wanted me to just say a few words and then things are changing here? See, we always consider him first. Lord, what do you say? Because I believe that's what Jesus did. When he got news that Lazarus was sick, he didn't just jump up and run down the street and go lay hands on him. He waited a few more days. When they brought the woman of adultery to him, he didn't just repeat something. He got down and he did, you know, doodled on the ground. And I believe he was hearing from heaven. Because he said, I only say the things I hear my father say. The only way you can say that is if you got to listen. you got to hear. And you got to consider, I'm not considering the position I'm in, the situation I'm in. I'm not considering my own whatever it is. I'm going to consider him. Because he's the only one that knows the end from the beginning and knows how to get me through this situation. With God, he's the only one that you can take a blind man and they begin to see. A deaf man can begin to hear, right? A sick man can get better. A broke man can be rich. Even a dead man can be made alive. It's only through Jesus Christ. And if that's the only way that all of that can happen, then everything should be piled up into that. Amen?